On Thursday, October 11th, Transcoda City Councilor candidate Sean Nason came out to speak at the Northeast Business Exchange Speaker Forum. I went to St. Michael's Villa, I guess about three weeks ago, to, to talk to the seniors there. And uh, uh, there's a reason why I'm telling this story, because you'll have to flag me at the end. Um, I went there expecting only to talk for half an hour. Two hours later, I finished. Uh, I said, uh, you know, they said it was. They said it was great because you're. It wasn't. It wasn't a political talk. It was a conversation, and I think that's what, as a community, we need to do more and more of: is have these conversations so that everybody knows what's going on, right? Um, I view. I view the role as a counselor as a connector, right? I'm not the ones going out shoveling the yards full of snow, getting the wind rose out. I'm not the one that when your sewer breaks, going out and fixing it. We've, we've got many skilled people that, that do that in the city. What we need to do is make sure that they're doing it at a level that, you know, as a taxpayer, that it's getting done to. Um, I've used the analogy quite a few times. My son goes to school over in, uh, in the River Heights area because of our family dynamic and you know, it made the most sense at the time of, of life. And of course, once you start a school, kids build friends, you can never change that school, not without a whole lot of heartache. But uh, when I'm driving over there, and particularly in the winter, it holds true, is the level of street cleaning. Uh, it is done at a very higher level than what we get in Transcona. It's done at a very higher level than what's done in Osborne. I don't understand why. They, they, they seem to have a contract, because it's contracted out, but I don't know if it's John Oracle, you know, making sure that the contractor there is doing it to a certain standard, because that's what the expectation of the community is, but I, I would look to do the same here. And um, I had a situation when I worked for, for the Minister of Families, we had a contractor that uh, wasn't living up to standard of what government expected with regards to paying uh, for the uh, paying their subcontractors, and uh, it came up it came up to my desk, and I'm like, well, there, there's one solution to to send a message that this isn't acceptable, and that's to bar that contractor, and we did. We we barred the contractor from bidding on any contracts for five years. Now you know that may not be the end all and be all, but it it sends a message that. We're expecting higher, right? So, you know, I need to find out if that same level of expectation can be applied at the civic level. I hope it can, because, you know, walking around the community as much as I have in the last two and a half months, when you're on your feet walking the sidewalks, you do see a lot of the challenges we have in the community. And you don't have to go far from here. Just over by uh, Transcoma Memorial United, there's, there's a sidewalk that's got it's got uh, the barricades around it, just off to the curb. And it washed out under the sidewalk. I'm assuming it's a broken water main. But I, I, I guarantee that the depth from the tabletop to the ground is about what beside that sidewalk is. And it's been there for a while. Because the grass on the, on the mud that's down below is, is growing grass. And the water main shut off is about halfway to the floor below, below grade. I don't understand why they haven't fixed it. School's back in. Um, and I, had, I took a picture of it because it, it struck me, right? Because you can tell it's been sitting there for a while. And I, I put a post up online and you know, said, I want to work with the civil service to, to bring a higher level of service to our community. And it's kind of telling of some of the challenges we have because one of the people uh, posted, good luck with that. Laugh out loud. This is this is 2018. I clicked the person's post. Oh, the person works for City of Winnipeg. <laughs> so I don't know if he's being facetious or, or actually being funny about it, but it's it's one of those mindsets, right? It's the mindsets that people don't care. You you drive around, you you have you know brand new pavement, and I, I've heard this analogy many times. Brand new pavement laid down. Two weeks later, they'll come and they'll dig it up because, well, something might not be right or, or whatever it may be. I need to have a better understanding because 
time and time again you see that. Um, you know, just actually just down Regent here, they, they cut out right by my campaign office a, a strip of pavement. Well, that pavement was only done maybe five, six years ago. <coughs> Obviously, there's something challenging with that little section of pavement that they cut it out. Um, where this leads to is situations where we get less as a result of, of substandard work or, or work that's not up to standard, work that's not delivered on time, on budget. I come from a project management background with General Electric where um, <laughs> the tolerances are very small. Um, I was in the IT side where we had an expectation of 98% uptime. Now generally we actually tried to exceed that. There's not a lot of room between 98 and 100, but we, we were pretty close. But when things went wrong, we had to have a plan in place to fix things very quickly. And where I see that applying to the city is when we go to do a project, we need to make sure that we're doing the project for the right cost and the right time and to try not to exceed that. Because what happens in the city of Winnipeg is because we don't plan our infrastructure projects well enough, we're planning for next year. Okay, that's, that's one year. So the industry is like, well, okay, we don't know how, how much of this work will actually be realized because we don't know what the season's gonna bring. So we pay about a 30% premium on the work that we get done in the city of Winnipeg. So with having longer forecasts, working with the industry, working with other levels of government to have more predictable and stable funding, we can realize probably, it may not be 30%, but we can realize a significant savings to get more of this desperately needed infrastructure upgraded. Because the deficit that we have is over, I think the last I heard was about $3 billion infrastructure deficit within the city of Winnipeg. Um, the longer we wait, that price tag is not going down. No, it's going to. Yeah. yeah, year over year. We had the same challenge again, going, pulling back on my, my work with the Minister of Families. Uh, we had a half billion dollar deficit on maintenance and improvements for Manitoba housing stock. Now what the, the approach that our, our government has in Manitoba is we're not building new buildings for social housing. And there's, there's a couple reasons for it. It takes about twice as long in the, in the government market to build social housing as it does in the private market. And I don't know if it's the, the standards that they use or it's long-term building contracts, but because it costs so much, um, we don't, we're not able to support people as fast as we need to. So the, um, the approach now is to buy into some of these developments that are being built and have people be able to be supported quicker. So there's a bunch of new building that's going on behind Costco, apartment buildings and such. Quite a few of those, as I understand, are taking advantage of that per door government subsidy for affordable and social. It's a, it cost the province 60, around $65,000 a door. But there's $65,000 a door available to the private market to ensure that their projects have persons in there. And it also, part of, part of the benefit of it is that you're not getting huge concentrations of individuals that are reliant on, on social need. And it, and it helps raise them up right, as opposed to pull them down. Because if you get into that funk of always needing to be given a hand out, you're not being supported with a hand up, right? And I, and I think, you know, we, we, if we continue on this, this approach, we may see some societal changes. Because what we've been seeing is a more reliance on food banks, on social assistance, and there's also only so much money available to support those kinds of things. You know, and I, I've heard, I've heard a few times. Well, why doesn't Matt, the the city of Winnipeg have be more engaged in social housing? There's a few areas where where they do get involved, 
and that's generally on tax and in, tax incentive funding. So it's deferring the taxes and reinvesting into it. Um, that usually goes for about a million dollars, and it's generally held to downtown. So. Uh, what I'd like to see is an opportunity where that can be expanded to, to more outlying areas to help support, you know, revitalization in some of our areas that, that you know, maybe there's social housing that we could realize in a, in a highly dense area. Um, you know, I don't, I don't view myself as a, as a social justice warrior. But I, I do view myself as a passionate individual. You know, that's part of what drew me to Rotary is, is the compassion, the service to others. And, you know, knowing a couple of Rotarians here, that, you know, it's, it's service, service above self, right? And I, you know, I do live with that mantra. And, you know, we, we've got a new president a few months ago, and it was right around the time that I was, I was seriously thinking about running. And our, our mantra this year is be the inspiration. And I took that to heart. I, I take that as, as sort of a call to arms, per se, right? I mean, you can't sit on the sidelines and, and complain that nobody's doing anything. If you have the tools and the skill set to do something, you need to lend your voice to it. And, you know, that, that was the biggest call for me. I've had a passion for politics since I was 12 years old. We had two channels where I grew up in New Brunswick. And it was a small railroad town as well. That's part of the reason why I ended up in Transcona as my, as my home. That and my wife grew up here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, having two channels, you had a choice of CBC or CTV. And while Beachcombers was big on, big on the TV at that time, so was, I think Kings, Kings of Kensington was the other one. So for a while, you know, in my uh, 18 to, to 28 frame, I lived in Toronto. I wanted to be the king, king of Kensington. I didn't have a grocery store, but I worked in a kitchen. <laughs> but uh, you know, small town, small town, railroad town. Those values uh, build something in your DNA. Now, um, you guys don't live in the community, right? But. You're here. You're entrenched in well, the community. I was community. adopted when I was with the kids. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they told me. But that, that's what I mean. Like you're yeah. you're indoctrinated in the in our community, yeah. and you know once that gets in your blood, it, it's you know you are part of the community, right? You may not be able to vote here. I wish you could, but um, more time here probably. <laughs> yeah. But the, you know doing better for your community is is very important, and it, and one person can't do it alone. I mentioned earlier, you know, like, I'm not the one picking up the garbage, cleaning the roads, but I am the one that, if you're not getting the services that you need or, or require, I'm the one that can advocate for the community to, to get those. And I, my personal feeling is where, you know, there's, there's eight of us in the field, everybody brings value to the table, but my main differentiator is I've, I've worked in the community on the political level. I've worked on connecting our community with significant grants to, to realize stuff in our community. And I feel that at the city level I can continue that work and have more say on, you know, working with the community on what our priorities are. You know, talking young to old, I know that I'm hearing loud and clear that additional recreation options are something that our community wants. We have no indoor gym uh, space for pickleball. It's at my home community club of Oxford, and I've heard from some seniors that complain that it's too small. It's a very popular sport at this time. And you know what? In 10 years, it may not be the most advantageous sport for people, but maybe there'll be something else. If we plan for it in the future, and have the facilities for people to, to play sports or be physically active, I think we'll be better for it. You know, I was at, I was at our community club last night because uh, it's basketball season and I'm handing out jerseys to kids because I don't have enough on my plate, but I committed to the community to be the basketball convener. And I'm gonna see that through until, uh, until such time as I'm not able to be on the board at Oxford and be that convener, but um, Club 352, I think it's called. 
was upstairs. Larry Kobash, par pardon me if I mispronounced his name, but he runs a dance club um, once a month on Wednesday evenings, I think. And they were dancing pretty hard up there, and it was and it's primarily seniors. So, you know, I found myself you know, toe-tapping a little bit, but there, there's a lot going on, and we need to make sure our community clubs are full from, from the time that they open to the time that they're they shut down, whatever time that may be. But if we have if we have an active and engaged community, we'll have a very very healthy community. We sorely need a zero access or zero entry, I guess it's called, pool. We've got we've got some older pools. We've got the Centennial. Is it Kinsman Centennial Pool? Sorry, I always got to make sure our service organizations are properly re represented. We've got Optimus Field. We've got uh, Bernie Wolf uh, pool, right? We, we have facilities that are, that are underutilized and somewhat out of date. I know Bernie Wolf School, the River East Transcona, and the school administration would love to shut down that pool. They want, they want to revitalize that, that pool. It's a, hot, it's a warm water pool, so it's causing some mold and ventilation issues within the school envelope. Um, and I think they've been arguing for closure of that for years. Uh, what we know is that uh, it's underutilized. There's, you know, I've talked to many seniors that, that, that know it's there, but they can never get into it. Uh, so, you know, realizing a rec center at the new center of Transcona. Downtown's still the heart of Transcona, but the new center of Transcona is Plessy Road, right? Our boundaries, our boundaries are from the yeah. perimeter to the east to Lage Modier to the west. The time between the two places is Plessy. Um, it's also the place of the high, high concentration of growth. What we need to, to ensure, though, um, as that area develops, is that we don't forget about our downtown. You know, we need to have a vibrant and healthy downtown. We need to find more businesses to attract people downtown, right? We've lost our bank, the last bank that we had in the downtown. And the library, too. It's going to the, li yeah. the library, too. Uh, I'll get to that one in a moment. But um, with, with losing the bank, we didn't just lose a bank. We lost, we lost a community hub, mm -hmm. right? The staff in there... The, the people that frequented there, it was it was a place for people just to go and chit chat, right? They're warm, friendly, engaging staff that were in there. Um, we need to find something to replace it, be it a bank or some other sort of social engaging area. I don't know if a brew t a brew pub will work, but you never know. <laughs> We, we have lots of bars. Um, I was listening to Marcy yesterday. I'll go on a bit of diatribe before I go back to, uh, to, to the down, downtown bars. But she was trying to remember the name of the bar next door. And I remember it quite well because anytime I worked late in Lawrence's office, all I heard was the music going on there. Because amazingly, even though it's a brick building, I guess it's a cinder block on the side. Um, the old Robert's Drug Store is paper thin walls, so so no matter what went on in the George, I could always hear it in in uh, in there, and uh, I always enjoyed visits by Peter Maruka, talking about you know days of yore when he was in there with his dad cutting hair. And, you know, there's something about this community that the you know our when our people grow old, they they don't really grow old. They're just their bodies are getting old, but their minds and the history are incredible. And we need to make sure that we connect those stories of our community with the next generation so those, that history is not lost. You know, I had the joy of serving with Peter on the board at uh, the museum. And, uh, you know, lots, lots of good stories. And I, I told the story of, uh, of being on the governance committee. And uh, Helen Marsh was the person in charge of the original governance. <clears throat> yeah, she uh, had, at our annual meeting was not too pleased that we had changed the governance. But I, I think she understood eventually that we had to align it, modernize it with being a city of Winnipeg museum. And uh, but anyways, back back to a healthy downtown. You know, I know a number of years ago there was the incentives to, to revitalize the storefronts 
to, to you know, bring them a little bit more modern, um, a little more attractive. But we still see some of the businesses that are that are you know struggling or, or not quite there yet. Um, we need, like I say, we need to have diversity. We need to bring some more uh, businesses into the community that will keep it alive. Not a not a nine to five Monday to Friday community, but it'd be nice to have a seven day a week vibrant community where people want to come, not just from Transcona, but come from other parts of the city to Transcona, right? You know, maybe they're coming to the new No Frills that's going to be opened up on, on Pleasant. But while they're there, they're going to come down, they're going to get aesthetic stuff, right? They're going to get massage, they're going to get go to the jeweler across the way. Maybe they're going to go to Tony's, get a haircut, right? So I don't think Tony's is open quite the hours that they might be looking for. But, you know, having having people come through here and experience Transcona, we're, we're almost full. Transcona is almost full of buildable properties. We've got a couple that are left, um, but I'm going to go to the museum before I, or not museum, the, the uh, library before I go on to another diatribe. Uh, but the, the library is closing in a couple weeks. Um, that means another vacant spot in our downtown core. And I've already heard from a couple people that I know quite well that want to come back to downtown. They've moved out of, out of Transcona, but they want to come back to downtown. So I hope that the city plan is to um, deal with the empty library, or, or as I assume it will be a shuttered library as quick as possible so that we can realize additional opportunities for downtown out of that building. Um, but more importantly, I think most importantly, is the seniors that live in the direct zone of the existing library, um, they're going to be shut out of an opportunity to, to be able to get out of their home and, and stroll over to the library. Um, so we need to find a way, um, it's either through uh, community connections, through the Transcona Council for Seniors, because I know they have a shopping ban, I don't know, I'm not sure who that's through. Uh, I think it's with Safeway. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, with Safeway Sobeys, I don't know how, you know. Well, Safeway Sobeys, Safeway, yeah, because no. that was. But I know, but I don't know if, yeah. if that will, Sobeys keeps changing their business models. Yeah. So we need to make sure that we engage them to make sure that they understand the importance of that community shuttle. And yeah. maybe we can convince them to perhaps expand their reach of when, how we use it. When they were going to, we are talking about shutting down the TD, and so Colleen Tackberry and I went and we talked about the importance of having, you know, the, the shuttle kind of thing, and then TD actually reluctantly said that maybe they would have a shuttle that they would pay for, but I don't know where that's going. But again, it comes back to connecting, being a yeah. community connector, yeah and being that voice with them. Yeah. You know, like perhaps, you know, there's a way that we can find find a way to, to have that business support our community, you know, in a way to connect the people with the library. Yeah. It's looking outside the box. Mm -hmm. I've always been an upper left quadrant thinker. Yeah. Um, even though I'm left-handed, I really should be thinking more of my right. <laughs> um, but it's it's being able to connect people, right? And I, and I see that as a very strong role of what a city councilor is. Um, and I, you know, I do hope that the community sees that as well. And you know, on October 24th, I hope I get the result that I'm looking for, and that's to be the next city councilor. Um, but the, you know, before I close, and I'll give you an opportunity if you have any specific questions. Hopefully, I still have time. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I've seen quite a few of my colleagues that I'm running up against uh, in this election be very anti-development. Um, the challenge with that is that developers are businessmen, just like many of you around the table. And they're also employers. You know, if you don't have business, you don't have employment, you don't have a thriving community, right? You don't have carpenters that are working. You don't have food service people that are working. You don't have service industry people that are working because there's no money to flow around. You don't have people buying vehicles down the road because there's no people that don't have money to buy those things and 
that's part of that's part of our economic driver within Winnipeg is development, but it's development that's planned, that's organized, um, and followed through with to make sure that the services are there for the community as well. And um, we talked earlier just down at that end of the table uh, about the expanded boundaries of, of Transcona. We go all the way down to Bishop Granin on the east side of Lage Maudier. So eventually Lage Maudier is going to be extended to meet back up to Fermor. Um, so that's, that's a very long extension of our community. And it has... That the subdivision that's down there is called Waterside Estates, or sorry, there's Waterside Estates that's just off Dougal. <coughs> They're also new to Transcona, but uh, Southland Park um, has always identified as St. Boniface, so it's a very huge culture shock for them to be part of Transcona. So it's also very important to remember that they're part of Transcona. So I'm going to have to take extra effort to make sure that they understand that they have as much of a voice as anyone. And hopefully, eventually, they'll embrace the fact that they're part of Transcona. But where I was going with it, that development is a Qualico development. Um, they've got a pond that's in there, and a, and a uh, dirt, lime, crushed limestone pathway. Um, but they have they have a playground structure that was put in there. But it was put in there by someone in the community, paid for it, and built it. There's not a city park. Come on in. It's open. I'm just talking to a business group. Feel free to listen. Um, but they have they have a park that that was built by an original resident that needs to be updated. Um, we have um, Waterside Estates, which is full of young. Both of them are full of young children. But Waterside Estates ex strikes me especially troubling is that as part of that development, it's an infill development in what is typically classified as industrial area. It was rezoned. And they were promised playgrounds. They were promised walking uh, pathways. Guess what they don't have? They don't have so much as a swing set for a community. They don't have a walking path for a community. Like they're, they're, they're landlocked in there. They can't easily access anything. There's the, the pathway along along uh, Dual Road that's there now. Yeah, okay. But for kids to, to go play, they have to get in a car and go over to Bernie Wolf School. Right? Like it's, it's challenging when we have these communities that don't have the activities to go along with them. You know, many many of the people down in the south end, it's, it's open. Oh yeah. And I, I the blue collar special is very good. I know, that's why I'm here. Okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, when you have communities that don't have the services in this, and there's quite a few seniors that there's a retirement, like a 55 plus condo development at the back of it, and they've, they've got nothing. Everything they, they have, they have to do by car. So, you know, we need to, as a community, find a way to, to get those connectors and get them the, the as priorities, um, they're not a priority to the city. They weren't a priority to the councillor that represented them. They were represented by Matt Allard. He has, he has a large constituent, a large ward to deal with, and he never really paid them the care and attention that they needed because to him, they were the outliers. They're basically transcona, but they're part of St. Boniface. And, you know, you know, Peter was talking down again at that end of the table about uh, up till 2016, he had the Transcona Playground Renewal Association yeah. that he was the chair of, and you were part of that no, as well. No, no, no. I just, he just knew about all the work just, that he was I doing. I just knew all the things that Peter knew. Well, and and again, as part of that, you know, developers support that, you know, whether they want to or not. Um, but we need we need to have groups like that that are that's their sole focus, because as a councillor, you're pulled in so many different directions to have people that are part of the community that that you know can do some of that yeoman's work to to bring forward those priorities of the community i think helps us realize these activities faster um, i know you know former mp lawrence tote there was a federal grant that was available 
at the time that the square was being built. And there was a half million dollars, I think close to half a million dollars that was realized as a result of that. Can you imagine how much more difficult it would have been to realize a completion of that project? Because it went towards the clock tower. Can you imagine the square without the clock tower? I think the clock tower makes the square. Uh, I know CN's got their logo up on it. So they, they threw a fair bit of money too. Uh, and I, was it a half million as well or more? No, no, how much did uh, CN put in? It was 50,000 for the 200? No. But again, it's connecting the community, right? Um, and I, I have without a doubt that there's other projects where we can realize, maybe not on that scale, but uh, significant private investment. You know, CN is a, is a major hub in our city. It's a major hub in Transcona. You know, they chose to build the training center here, which is a spectacular, absolutely spectacular investment in our community. The amount of people that are in our community and, you know, we're seeing a new hotel be built. And I think that's in part because of the new, of the new training center. These people have to have a place to, to to sleep when they're here. They need places to eat when they're here. I think they can only eat so much pizza hotline. It's good pizza. You know, <laughs> Dell's I suspect has seen a bit of an uptick in, in food deliveries. You know, I hope Tova is continuing to realize some of that. You know, and I had it was funny when I was here yesterday. I was saying to, to Travis, um, I had the opportunity. I think it may have been two weeks on the job when this play, when this restaurant opened, yeah. and Lawrence was in Ottawa. Yeah. So I had the privilege of coming here, and yeah. you know, Belinda was the the manager at the time, mm -hmm. and you know, to see us here so many years later, and that, you know, <laughs> yeah, we're we're doing good in the restaurant industry. It's generally a two year two year thing. Usually, you usually, know, I as a social enterprise, it's yeah. just that much harder. It is, like um, two to three years, I think, if business, if restaurants succeed, they probably have a yeah, chance, but yeah. it's so, hard, it's a hard business. You know, it's, a, it's a very hard business. Yeah. I think you've got a very loyal community following. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's one of those things that, as a community connector, is to keep trumpeting these things. Sean Loney, um, as a social enterprise guru, I don't know if he's had the privilege of coming here, but he sh certainly should. Uh, you know, I know the province is working on social impact bonds as a way to to find other ways to support. You know, giving again, giving that hand up, serving those that need need help. Uh, I'm hoping that they they have taken the time to to do it right. Um, I had the privilege of knowing quite a few people that were in the architect area of building that. So when that comes realized and they start calling for the for people to invest in it, I, I do hope that, that people do invest and that we can affect change in our, in our city and our province. Um, but I'm going to probably end at that and give an opportunity for you guys, if you have any specific questions, to, to you know, have the opportunity to, to, to grill me.